Folks, uh, quite an interesting story here. Star athlete Tony Humphreys uh, is transferring from Iona Preparatory School in New Rochelle, New York, after the assistant athletic director, Bernard Mahoney, made a racist remark to him. Now, Humphrey is a baseball player signed up to run track. Now, he's a major athlete already uh, deciding where he's going to go to uh, a major Division I a school. Now, Mahoney asked Humphrey why he wanted to run track. Well, Humphrey said he wanted to gain speed for baseball. What did Mahoney say to him? Oh, he gained his speed by running from the police. Humphrey was pissed off, so he came home, told his parents, and they're like, you're transferred to the public school. Humphrey said he's experienced racist incidents before and reported to school officials, but nothing was ever addressed. Humphrey announced his transfer on his Twitter account, quote, I'll be continuing my high school career at home. Pumped to return to Walter uh, Panis and will bring a championship back to Cortland. Mahoney has since resigned. Students staged a walkout as well in support of Humphrey. Hmm, you got your speed by running from the cops. How about that, Omakongo? Wow. <laughs> wow, man. First of all, the, uh, he should be fired. He shouldn't have an opportunity to resign. And I, I, I work in schools, public, private, and charter, all across this country. And this happens on a regular I really respect this young brother for exercising his agency. We're seeing guys younger and younger exercising their agency and their choice to understand their value, to let them know I don't have to put up with this. Uh, there are a lot of other kids who don't have that same level of platform or, 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 no, or, or fame to be able to make a move like that, and they're kind of stuck in those situations. But I'm hoping that this will further call that out because it's happening more often than we know. And kudos to those students also. But look, man, this happens all of the time. And this is not, I'm sure this is not the first instance because the, the, the brother said that there have been many instances of this happening. And I really believe that these guys really got to get on point in terms of understanding that these kids are waking up. They've been inspired by people like Colin Kaepernick and, and just so many other people out there. And they have a platform as well. I'm sure that this brother has more followers than, than, than the guy who resigned. So they're going to be drawing more attention to this, and these schools better get on point right now because there's going to be a lot of cameras showing up on these doors as these stories uh, start to come out even more. Uh, Julian. You know, first of all, I've got to give kudos to my alma mater, Boston College, uh, for he has chosen to go there, and I'm excited about that. Uh, man, I hope that BC acts right, and usually they do, but not always. These PWIs don't always know how to act around our people. But secondly, I think that uh, that Maloney, Mahoney, whatever his name was, should never be allowed to work with young people again in his whole entire lifetime. 
I mean, he's this is not the first time he's made these kind of comments. Clearly, he's done it before, and clearly he's gotten away with it. This young brother has actually said there have been comments before. He reported them. He took it to the top. They didn't do anything. So his parents probably said, look, enough is enough. Our child does not need to be denigrated by an idiot who doesn't have enough sense to applaud his commitment to his athletic career. So, th you know, again, as Amakongo says, our young people are saying over and over again, we ain't putting up with this. Before, folks put up with it. We swallowed it. We said, okay, well, it just was that one time. No, this is systemic. It is a systemic way of treating young black men and women, especially when they're athletes, but also when they're scholars, it has to stop. You know, this is, the thing you hear, Maurice, is like the brothers just trying to play baseball, but you know, look, it is, you know, look, you got, you got these old white folks and that's, that's, that's how they think. And so imagine uh, what, what they say about other athletes. Exactly. It's completely outrageous. And as Omakongo stated, it happens all the time to African Americans in different situations. As a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer, I talk to an individual who may be charged with their first offense every day. I hear the comments that are made from police officers and people in the community who, about a person who has a lack of criminal history. They may make a traffic stop, pull this person over, run their background and say, oh, wow, you're 25 years old and have no criminal record, or you're 40 years old, you have no felonies. Historically, African Americans were portrayed as criminals, and this faculty member was completely out of line perpetuating that stereotype. Yeah. Now, all black men, black people have some con contact with the law, have some type of criminal history. He was racist. He was completely out, out of line. His comment was uncalled for, and I'm glad he's no longer employed. All right, folks, back to our my unfiltered video in just one moment. <laughs> Alexa, play our favorite song again. Okay. I only have Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Background. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. <laughs> All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? This story uh, is uh, quite interesting. He spent 39 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Now the man accused of raping Lovely Bones, author of Alice Siebold, has been exonerated. A New York judge cleared Anthony Broadwater of raping Siebold when she was a student at Syracuse University. Here's what happened during and after Broadwater's hearing. Uh, you know, Sully these proceedings by saying, I'm sorry, that doesn't cut it. This should never have happened. And, uh, I will say to Mr. Broadwater that I assure him uh, that it will never happen again, that we will never let junk science into a courtroom in this county. I think as Mr. Fitzpatrick has pointed out, Mr. Broadwater cannot get those 16 years back. But based upon my review of the motions and the representations of counsel, this court grants the defendant's motion. <laughs> they take his conviction. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Judge. I couldn't help but cry. The relief that a district attorney of that magnitude would 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 side with me concerning this case—it's 
it's, it's, it's so profound. I did everything I could do to always show people that, hey, I'm never that type of guy. I never could be that type of guy. A lot of doors been slammed in my face for jobs. She wanted children. I wouldn't bring children to the world because of this. And now we're past the age we can't have children. It ruined his life. His life has been ruined over this, you know, not just incarceration, but wrongfully being labeled a sex offender. These are things that he will never get back. So she wrote this book, uh, and it was being made into a movie that um, is, is, is actually is in, in, in the works on in Netflix. But, but here's what's interesting here. Uh, it was actually the movie, Julian, that led to all of this. The folks who were working on the script, uh, they discovered there were discrepancies between what she writes in the book and the actual case. One of the writers then hires a private eye to check the, check the stuff out. Well, all of a sudden, first of all, uh, the man had been jailed for 16 years. Um, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden, um, they find out that something was awry. They then reach out to him to pass it on. He then actually hires an attorney. That is what actually led uh, to uh, this exoneration. Now, again, uh, uh, the man here, uh, first of all, Broadwater, uh, he went to prison. Uh, he was released from prison in 1998, okay, uh, when he was 38 years old. But this has been over his head for all of these years, and he finally gets exoneration. But it was the movie, the Netflix movie, that actually led to this. And as a result of the exoneration, um, the uh, actor, Victoria Pedretti, she's dropped out of the movie. A previous executive producer also dropped out of the movie. She was supposed to play Alice Sebold. She says, can't do it now because of this. And she's absolutely right. Who wants to play a lying piece of you-know-what who caused a man 16 years of his life? When he was crying, I want to cry too. He has lost so much. And, you know, white women clutching their pearls and putting their fingers on black men, it's got to stop. I didn't read her book, and I wouldn't read it if somebody sent it to me. I think that this is just disgraceful. But I, and, and a widely noted author, I mean, perhaps she was mistaken, but she's held by this story, turned it into a book, turned it into a revenue source, turned her fake rape with her false accusation of this black man into a revenue source. Netflix needs to trash this movie. She, her royalties need to go to this brother. This is more egregious than anything I could possibly imagine. So what happened here was that she identified him in court, even though identifying someone else earlier. Mm -hmm. That right there, um, Omakongo, uh, and again, as they began to look into this, they, they said, look, there are just way more problems with this. She really could not identify who committed the rape, but it got pinned on him. Uh, at the time, a 22-year-old Marine. Man, just like Dr. Marvel said, I wanted to cry, too, watching that. And we can... It, 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 I'm just thinking about the failures of the court system, that it would take somebody working on a movie to see some discrepancies that this court couldn't find. And why couldn't they find it? Because this was another throwaway brother who nobody cared about, despite his military experience. People always want to go down when they, when they get these particular suspects. Oh, they got a record. Oh, they served time. Or, or they, they dropped out of school, whatever. This man was in the military, you know, a, a veteran. 16 years of his life and having to live that life. I, I know people who've had to go through the whole thing about coming out of, of prison. For, for crimes they committed. I don't know anybody who's been on the sex offender registry, but to be on, to be on that in addition to already being an, an ex-convict, it is ridiculous. And somebody needs to come off some serious paper because this brother has lost the opportunity. I'm thinking about my own kids right now. He's lost the opportunity to do that, right? He's lost the opportunity to raise a family, to do, do things for the community, further serve his country he was in the Marines. And yes, Netflix needs to scrap this. But again, it shows how our judicial system just threw another brother away. And I'm hoping that he's going to get some form of justice for this because there's so much of his life he just can't get back. 
um, what is uh, interesting here is that uh, the producer, the producer, um, Timothy uh, Mucciante, um, th this is what he said. The script was very good, but it didn't track the book as closely as I would have preferred, and that just made me wonder, why is that? Why do we have to gloss over these facets of the book? I was actually fired from the film because I was not cooperating with everyone. Some of the reports indicate that I left the film based on this, but they fired me as executive producer, and frankly, I was a bit relieved. There was so much angst about these issues. Now, the actor who was supposed to play Broadwater um, called and made it clear, as you see right here, he did not want the part anymore. And so you got that as well. So you have all of these examples, all these examples uh, here where people had uh, issues uh, with this movie, uh, again, and it was M Mucciante uh, who hired a PI to look into this, and that is what the, got the ball rolling uh, to free this man uh, from prison. That, to me, um, it is absolutely uh, surprising. Uh, it is uh, shocking, and, uh, and, and it just... It, it, it's just stunning again, uh, Maurice, that when, whenever these cases come up, 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, it's a brother who's the one who's having to serve time in prison for something he didn't commit. It, it, exactly. It, it's sad how easily our system convicts black men. We have a white woman, a white woman cries, says something happened to me, and we're automatically considered guilty. But the important thing that the country has been doing is we've been getting progressive prosecutors elected from all over the country. They're starting to review some of these old cases. They're trying to correct some of the mistakes. And it's, it's so unfortunate that so many individuals have lost years of their lives as a result of wrongful convictions, such as in this situation. We had recently Kevin Strickland, who was recently released after serving years after being accused from mur of murder. We have Malcolm X murders. Their convictions were recently overturned by progressive prosecutors. That's that's what we need. I'd like to see the shift that this country is making in correcting some of these wrongs and these injustices that our people have been ensuing for years. Well, actually, I got an idea. How about if Netflix does a, does a movie on him? There you go. Yeah, yeah. there you right. go. Just saying. As Almacongo yeah. has said earlier, we don't know what happens to these brothers when they are falsely accused when they are then released, when like Mr. Strickland, as uh, Maurice has mentioned, you get out, you don't have any money. Mr. Strickland, 60 some years old, he's not gonna get social security because he hasn't paid into it. Um, the state of Missouri has denied him any recompense because there's no DNA evidence. Well, there would be no DNA evidence because he wasn't there. How could there be DNA when he wasn't there? If the state of Missouri paid him the 36000 per year that they say they pay people, he'd get $1.5 million. Well, thank you, GoFundMe, for the people who raised the money. But that ain't the bottom line. The bottom line is they keep crushing black men, and we need to know how people survive. That's a Netflix movie. All right, folks, back to our whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger that's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me, Me too. too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision. An SUV built around you. All of you. Oh, Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
got you, Pop. Um, illegally selling water with our permit? On my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey, remember, give me your ass. We don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. Oh, goodness. In Tennessee, a group of parents, a group of white parents, called for the removal of a book about the life of, yes, Reverend Arthur Martin Luther King, Jr. This is the first complaint filed under Tennessee's new anti-critical race theory law. In an 11-page complaint filed by a conservative parents group, Moms for Liberty, the group claims that the book Martin Luther King, Jr. and the March on Washington was among a set of lessons promoting anti-American rhetoric. However, the state's Department of Education declined to investigate the book because the lessons took place last year. Not that they're stupid, but they don't actually apply this year when the law was passed. Amisha, people, people have to understand and this is precisely when, at Food Christopher Rufo, and all the people who sit there talking about anti critical race theory, the issue was not critical race theory, which is only taught in law schools and not taught uh, anywhere else. They want to label anything black, they want to label anything dealing with race, anything dealing with equity, anything dealing with diversity as anti critical race theory. That is their aim. Absolutely. And I think that we have to talk about this over and over and over again. Critical race theory was never the goal for Republicans. It was never the goal for conservatives. It was never the goal for this new wave of education reform. What they want to do is eradicate any knowledge of American history that is inclusive to the struggle, the fight for civil rights, as well as a lot of the atrocities that white Americans have um, embedded upon or encroached upon people of color, be it whether they're Black, Latino, Native American, or otherwise. Um, they are trying to strip and be able to only tell the history they want to tell of the shining white, get, white guy hero um, it, reiterated over and over again throughout American history. They don't want to talk about the, the, the Trail of Tears. They don't want to talk about the Civil Rights Movement. They don't want to include books that speak on the atrocities of slavery, the injustices that followed Reconstruction, um, the Civil Rights Movement in and of itself, of the, of the lynchings, both in my granddaddy and great granddaddy's day, but also happening in modern day America. These are things that they want to strip from the books because they don't want a, a next generation of young people to learn about them. They don't want to have um, any bit of heritage actually represented for people of color in those books. And let's be real, Roland, very little of our story was actually included in the history books to begin with, long before this critical race theory argument was ever even thrown out. But this isn't about CRT. The argument has always been white people trying to design, um, it, to design books and literature based on their view of what America is. And their view of what America is does not include cultural representation of us. It does not include the pathway that we have we have walked throughout this country and the many atrocities that have been bestowed upon us, as well as, in all honesty, some of the things that we have done that have helped to benefit this country as Black people. Those things are, are we're fighting to have remain in textbooks as well. It is a very undercut and a very disgusting practice, but it is one that they have been fighting to do for quite some time now and are using the school boards, you know, weaponizing school boards and, and getting more and more of these extreme right-leaning individuals on school boards so that they can advance removing those the literature that speaks to the Black experience, removing the historical context of the Black experience. This is their goal. This was never a CRT argument to begin with. This was one basically on its face to erase all things Black from the history books. That is diminishing America. It is diminishing the role that we have taken in this country. It is diminishing the, the, the atrocities that we face, but also the successes and the things that we provided this country that have made it stand for so long. They want whiteness to rule, Mustafa. Of course, this is about politics, power, and money. So they looked and they saw the, the whipping that they took in 2020, and they said, how are we going to make sure that when we get to 2022 and 2024, that we can get our base whipped up enough that we can get enough voters to come out? This is a, a Willie Horton moment for those who understand history long enough 
when you got to have a boogeyman. So they use CRT as the boogeyman to get people uh, energized on, on the right. And, and, and if you don't call that out, then, then you're not really thinking through this whole process. The other part of it is, as Amisha said, it is about the whitewashing of history. Um, because if you can do that, then you don't have to address all these egregious sets of actions that still continue to happen in policy and that happened before. And then that's tied to resources. So people want to be able to control the resources uh, and they want to make sure that there's not investment in the areas that have been disinvested in. Because when you reinvest or finally have investments in those areas, people begin to have more free time. When people have more free time, they can get more engaged in all these processes that happen on the local, the county, the state level, and more people have time to dedicate also to getting engaged in the political process. So it is cyclical, but it is also very clear the things they're doing. And then the last point that I will raise, it also gives those folks who are racist and nationalists and all these other types of things, the justification for many of their actions as well. So that is a component of it also. So it is all those things coming together and how they're trying to utilize CRT to justify their sets of action. All right, folks, back to our my unfiltered video in just one moment. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure, it's wireless. Pick something we all like. OK, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger that's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me, Me too. too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision, an SUV built around you, all of you. Folks, oh, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? profile departure from Vice President Kamala Harris administration. Chief spokesperson and senior advisor Simone Sanders will be leaving her post at the end of the year. Sanders worked on the campaign trail to get President Biden and Vice President Harris elected. She previously worked with the Bernie Sanders campaign when he campaigned for president. Simone Sanders did not provide a reason for her leaving in her farewell note to staff. Some political observers find it ironic. Sanders' leaving came on the same day Stacey Abrams launched her campaign for Georgia governor. Communications director Ashley Etienne left last month to pursue other opportunities. I want to welcome my panel, who I know has plenty to say about this and other matters. First, ladies first, Reese Colbert, welcome, founder of Black Women's Views. Hi there, Reese. Hey, Monique, looking good. Dr. Greg Carr, thank you, girl, thank you. Dr. Greg Carr, uh, Department of Afro-American Studies at the Howard University, HU. Greetings, Dr. Greg. You know, good to see you, Monique. You're holding it down well. Thank you. Uh, and Faraji Muhammad, the one and only radio and TV host. Welcome, welcome, bro. So what in the world is happening? Um, Reese? Well, um, I think this is uh, much ado about nothing. I think Simone Sanders is incredibly talented and certainly in high demand in whatever she decides that she wants to pursue. Uh, she's had a very long, grueling last couple of years. The campaigns are relentless. They require a lot of travel, a lot of dedication, long nights. 
and then to turn around on the heels of a very hard fought primary, the general election, and going to an even more grueling White House in which the vice president is under unprecedented scrutiny. I can understand why she's ready to move on. I think that Simone Sanders has a very positive and really collegial relationship with Vice President Kamala Harris. And so I just think that, you know, people come and people go. Uh, the White House is a very tough place to work. I don't think that there's any uh, sense of it's too tough for her, but I just think that she's probably ready to move on to the next chapter. And so I wish her well. Well, and here's the thing, um, Reese, before, before I hear from our gentleman, it, the, the people in the White House make clear um, that they've known that she was going to be departing at the end of the year for over two months. So this was the right. plan, really, for her to stay through the first year of the administration. And then who knows what it is she's going to do next. I agree with you. Whatever it is, she's going to be phenomenal in it. But I'm personally just sick of the any and everything that happens is a big deal if it is at all related to the vice president of the United States. Absolutely. I would like to remind people by this time during the Trump administration, we had gone through multiple secretary of states. We had gone through multiple cabinet officials at various levels. People had to res resign over corruption, over cronyism. Um, and so, uh, you know, we also had multiple uh, press secretaries by this point that uh, Trump had. And so this whole notion that a, a, a senior advisor to the vice president is somehow super uh, newsworthy is also is really ridiculous. Um, and, and I think it just they're trying to feed this narrative of there being drama and dysfunction when the drama and dysfunction is coming from the outside and trying to, you know, project a sense of, of, of gossip and, and tawdriness on the vice president's office, which is very busy doing a lot of very substantive and important work. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, folks, back to our Roland Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Alexa, play our favorite song again. Okay. I only have Folks, Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punches! A real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? In Arizona, the cop who shot and killed a Walmart customer in a wheelchair is out of a job. We want to warn you, what you are about to see is disturbing and graphic. If you have any children in the room, this is the time to ask them to leave. You are about to see what happened when Tucson officer Ryan Remington was working an off-duty job as a security officer Monday night at a Walmart when 61-year-old Richard Lee did not obey his command not to enter the store. Bravo, one eight. He's coming in 84. I have a male suspect that just shoplifted knife in front of him. He pulled a knife on me. He's currently westbound in the parking lot. I need an additional unit to Bravo, one eight at 1650 West Valencia Road. We're going to be 1039. Bravo, any copies? White male, flannel t-shirt. White hat, we're in front of the DD's discount. And Bravo 1 8, we're currently northbound on Oak Tree going towards the Lowe's. And Bravo 1 5 to 1 U 5. He's confronted by loss prevention. He pulled the knife on loss prevention while I was right there. 
in Bravo and they were on the east side of Lowe's in the parking lot, so just west of Oak Tree. Still going south though. Tucson Mayor Regina Romero said Remington's actions were unconscionable and indefensible. Remington's attorney said the department's overview of the case is only half the story. The Pima County Attorney's Office is now reviewing the incident. I think they probably mean the crime. Okay, going to the panel. Where, where, where do we even start? Uh, where do we even start? Uh, Faraji, um, are you still regrouping well, from what we just saw? I'm, I'm trying to figure out where he was a threat. I mean, he said he first he's 61 years old. Second, he's in a wheelchair. So how is this man a threat to two able-bodied police officers? I mean, he, he didn't just shoot one time, only he shot this man seven times. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. That's what I'm saying. This is not, this is not rocket science. I mean, you could just, you can say, sir, sir, you know, fire a warning shot or something or, or, or use your taser or something. But you just, I mean, the man is literally in a wheelchair and you shoot him that many times because he's rolling into a load with a knife. You could, you mean to tell me as a police officer, you can't get a knife from a man in a wheelchair. You are a whole bitch. You are a coward. Yep, I mean, I got nothing. I don't know what to say about it, Reese. Well, a shoplifting shouldn't result in, uh, in an execution, a parking lot execution. Um, this is basically the cop. I'm gonna still, Dr. Carr's word, hunting. Um, it's ridiculous that something like this escalated to that level, but, you know, these cops know that they can get away with it or they believe that they can, but it's unconscionable. I understand that, you know, he he said, if you want to, if you're going to get this knife away from me, you have to shoot me. That's not a dare, you know. Even if he was being a little bit belligerent, you don't get to, you're not supposed to in this country that we supposedly have laws get to execute a man for shoplifting, I mean... It's 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 ridiculous, but this is the culture of the police that we have and the policing we have in this country. <sighs> yeah, I mean, and 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 they claim furtive gestures. They claim, and I, I'm sure we're going to hear something about in defense of others. I mean, it's it's. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, go ahead. No, no, we. I agree, and Reese, you you didn't steal that. I mean, that's what it is. They're hunting. They are hunters. And the police forces in this country want you if you have a hunting mentality. If you do not, they do not want you. There are many law enforcement officials in this country who don't have a hunting mentality, and they are under constant persecution, as we saw with your brother in Louisiana, who they ran out of his job because he wanted to be a human being and not a hunter. Uh, the 10th juror seated today in the Potter trial. I was, again, listening to Professor Porter, who was narrating, this is a white man who said that he considered becoming a member of the police force, but then he said, I thought about it and I said, I was afraid that one day I might have to use my gun. Mm. So I decided not to. He also said in his questionnaire, his jurist questionnaire, that he didn't understand how a cop like uh, the, the, like, uh, the woman who shot Dante Wright, uh, Potter, could mistake a gun for a taser when in fact she should have the muscle memory born from years of being on the force. What we saw right, right then was a premeditated murder by a hunter who set it up by saying into his little shoulder with all his his courage, uh, knife. So as you said, uh, Monique, he's setting up the murder. And then we watched him empty nine shots into a man in a chair who then slumped over and died. That is ne not going to stop in this country. 
until we stop it. And then, frankly, whether it be Kyle Rittenhouse getting his car driving from one state to another and asking the police, can I be a deputy and shoot some people? And they say yes. Whether it be the McMichael brothers tracking down Ahmaud Aubrey, and the only reason that they were convicted is because some stupid attorney on their side, and they say stupid as far as they're concerned, let slip a video because the prosecutors had already set it up for them not to be charged. If this man is not not only arrested and convicted, and Arizona won't do that because his, this, 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 the uh, county attorney has already said just because he had other options doesn't mean that the action he took wasn't inappropriate. This man not only needs to be convicted, you know, people say, well, if you're against the death penalty, you have to be against it in all cases. Right. Uh, Right. I'm like out of well. <laughs> I'm like Rosa Parks. You know what? Give them what they gave you. In fact, she ended, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott started this week in 1955. Rosa Parks said one of her earliest memories was sitting at her grandfather's feet in their little house in Tuskegee, and he would go to sleep with a rifle over his lap. And she said, as a little girl, he slept there, and he, we all, he had to sleep with our clothes on. And she said, I wanted to see him kill a Ku Kluxer. That's Rosa Parks. This is gonna stop when we stop it. Yeah, I'll go, y'all go look up Rosa Parks. Y'all think about that bus. You better go look back when she said, I want to see him kill a Ku Klux Klan. Well, anyway. but, but looking at the, the prior case that was discussed, um, the Goodson case, I mean, I don't know how you call this anything other than an execution. And yeah. I'm glad, of course, that um, he's being indicted. Uh, with two charges of murder and one count of reckless homicide, but it it leads you to wonder how many more uh, similarly situated, like-minded uh, people there are who right. are are committing state-sanctioned murder and state-sanctioned assault, um, and and really it's ego, right? Because. If, if, even if all of the facts are true, as he claims, that the man was driving and waving around a gun, at the time that he killed him, he was walking into his own self-house. So we've yes. got an officer who's angry, and it's, it's oh, no, you won't. Uh, mm. and, and, and they used their guns to settle those scores. Um, so it, it, to me, is, you know, we need something more uh, than what we have now, but I'm... I'm at a loss for what that is. Reese, you got any answers before we move on? I don't. I don't have the answers, but stop hunting. That's all I can say. I mean, it's going to fall on deaf ears, but stop hunting. And, and just the one more thing about the Goodson. There was no even exchange that they had. There was no traffic stop. There was no warrant. There was no right. nothing. It's a man walking into his house with Subway sandwiches. You cannot right. tell me a man who go to Subway and decide he want to turn into a cowboy walking into his own house and have a shootout from the back, walking away, that's, that, the, the, that doesn't even add up, but stop hunting us, please. I can't even say please, because I only want to, I don't like to beg. Stop <gasps> doing it, period. Say well, please with a Winchester rifle. That's what I'd be well said, a Winchester rifle. Please goes a lot longer when you got one aimed at them. I'm not, I'm not mm. fooling with you, Greg. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm well. <laughs> 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 oh, we were not providing you all suggestions. This is just just Dr. Greg philosophizing, uh, uh, leaving leaving some food for thought. It wasn't a directive. <laughs> no, but Moni, first, well, I, you know, Lynch law and all its phases. Y'all look it up. I'm not. I, that's not me talking. Lynch law and all its phases. Winchester rifle. Look it up for yourselves. All right, folks. Back to our roadblock unfiltered video in just one moment. Once upon a time, there lived a princess with really long hair who was waiting for a prince to come save her. But really, who has time for that? Let's go. Feel myself. Feel she myself. ordered herself a ladder with Prime one day delivery, and she was out of there. I want some hood girls looking back at it and a good girl in my tax bracket. Now, her hairdressing empire is killing it. And the prince, well, who cares? Prime changes everything. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. 
bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Michigan officials are still trying to find out why 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly went on a violent rampage, killing four and injuring seven at Oxford High School Tuesday. Crumbly, charged as an adult, is facing several charges of terrorism, murder, assault, and possession of a firearm in the commission of a felony. The school administration's the school administrators met with Crumbly's parents about what his teachers described as disturbing behavior Monday and Tuesday, just hours before the shooting. Evidence from Ethan's journal, cell phone, and social media posts have investigators believing the shooting was a premeditated plan. Video taken the night before the attack shows Crumbly talking about shooting and killing his peers at school. He also boasted about the new gun his dad purchased, which he used during the shooting. There are also reports of an alleged countdown to the shooting and references to the devil on his now deleted media account. The question lies, could this tragedy have been prevented? Reese, uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you answer that question, but I'm gonna say what I think I have said on this show at least 13, 11,000 times until the US government acknowledges that there is a real problem with white males between the ages of now 14, 15, and 33, it's not going to stop. Right. And, you know, I said this earlier today on Clay Kane Show, I'll say it again, believe white men. When they tell you that they're going to shoot up a school, when they tell you that they devil worshiping or whatever demonic stuff that he was into, believe them. You know, it's crazy because if a troubled black child is meeting with, with, you know, getting called into the principal's office, that child is getting suspended and they're getting expelled, okay? There's consequences for them. We've seen 10-year-old and, and, and adolescent black girls being tossed around like, like rag dolls by school resource officers and police officers, and yet this, uh, this, this killer... Um, has been treated with kid gloves. I mean, even the New York Post uh, released a picture of him that was not his mugshot. It was a picture of him as like a like an eight-year-old choir boy or something. And so we need to stop treating white male rage with kid gloves. We need to stop calling it economic anxiety. We need to stop calling it, you know, these different euphemisms where we talk about their under, you know, we, we, we play into their culture wars by having the conversations on their terms, on things like critical race theory, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to start taking seriously the threat. I mean, Janet, not, I forget her, how you say her last name, uh, Janet something or another. She talked about this back, you know, before Bush was even in office, when mm. Clinton was still there, about, you know, the, the threat that, you know, white domestic extremism is posing. So I'm not saying this was racially motivated or anything, but we have to start taking these troubled white boys, men, whatever you want to call it, seriously. All that re all that energy that people put into over policing and oppressing and 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 uh you know putting black kids and brown kids in this prison to a uh, school to prison pipeline. I'm not saying you do the same thing with white kids, but I'm saying don't let them off so easily because they're the ones out there shooting up these schools. Right, absolutely agreed. And and the thing is, Faraji, um, they're not, they don't just drop in out of the sky at 14, 15, <laughs> mad as hell. They are being raised, um, something closer to, that looks like raised. Um, they, they were once babies and, and then toddlers uh, before they worked their way into all of this rage. And they are being affected by outside 
influences, not not just mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not totally. I think parents probably do have a responsibility in this case, but it's not just that. We're seeing how they are being indoctrinated and conditioned um, through the dark web and through all of these outside sources. Um, what what is it that needs to be done to run down these rabbit holes and stop it? I mean, I, I think there are a few things at play here, Monique. One is um, just the point that you were making. You know, it, it, when you see a child 15 years old who decides to go up in the school and he's going to start shooting and killing people, the first thing I would look at as an investigator is looking at the parents. What's going on inside the home, right? Because the home serves as the base of a child's understanding about the world and themselves. So that's the first thing. So I think that conversation of, about parents and responsibility, no, no parent, we, we, we can say, oh, no, we would never raise our children to be killers. But even in the black community, we expose our children to too much grown-up stuff in terms of violence, in terms of not being able to properly resolve conflict in terms of teaching black boys and black girls that you can't uh, express yourself, you know, don't, don't, don't cry and all of this garbage that we send, right? And I'm saying, and I'm using that as an example because we don't, we, he could have been exposed to the same thing. Now, does that mean that he should get a slap on the wrist? Hell no, he shouldn't. Because at 15 years old, a baby knows the difference between right and wrong. So by the time you get to 15, you know, what you're about to do is either right or wrong. Going up into a school and shooting people, that unless you are a sociopath, then you your brain should register and say, you know what, this may not be a great idea. So so when we have those that conversation, but I also want to have the, the discussion about the fact that this is not just about guns. Please, let's not make this about guns because we know white media often says, you know, uses that excuse. Well, access to guns, the gun policies, gun laws needs to be stricter. Don't no, they? That's not the don't, don't they? Yeah. I mean, yes, but at the same time... I mean, are they wrong? wrong? I'm just, <laughs> just checking, <laughs> just checking. No, no, I'm not saying it's wrong, but this kid didn't get the gun off the street. Uh-huh. He got it from his parents who, who, for some reason, did not teach him certain things. Now, again, we don't know if this child is a sociopath or psychopath. What, what we can only speculate. But the point is, is that let's not move, remove, uh, let's not get away from the simple fact that he made a choice. This child, just like Rittenhouse, just like all of the other white males that go into, that's a, that's a mind thing. And Dr. Carly, I'm sure you can, you can attest to the fact that we see this all the time. And, and what we're seeing right now is that we're seeing white men and boys who are feeling threatened who feel like they're losing power, are mm -hmm. losing their minds right now. You can take it from President Trump all the way down to this joker. Mm -hmm. They will feel like they're losing their minds right now. And so how do they handle that? They only handle that by, I'm going to shoot and kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and that's, that's the part of the conversation that we don't want to really have because we don't really, really believe that an individual can think like that. But guess no. what? It happens every day in the black community too. Mm -hmm. When you got yeah. black people who say, "Man, I'm just going to do me," and next thing you know, we shooting and killing each other. Mm -hmm. That's a mindset. Something is inherently wrong when the human being is at a place or at a thinking where they feel like the only way they can resolve a problem, the only way they can relieve certain type of feelings within them, is that they can they can pl they play God and take somebody out like that. Yeah, I that's and a, I. A, I, I see. I, I, I hear you. I agree with you. My, the only pen, uh, if I, if I had to put a pen in it, um, to, to make a point <laughs> that the, the, the separation for us, where we got, you know, crazy and depraved and psychopathic and, and homicidal people here, the same way they are everywhere else in the world. The difference is that we are weaponized differently to be able to do something about it. So I don't think that we can ignore the gun conversation while we're having but, the conversation about the state of our mental health. Dr. Greg, yeah, but I got, I got, I got, I got, 
got to keep moving. I got a question for right, Dr. Gray because he's my. It's a culture of violence in this country that we haven't fully we haven't fully embraced. I I, I hear leave. you. America loves violence. I that's hear you. Why, that's why. But I'm still going to Dr. Greg. I hear you and right, I'm going go to ahead, Dr. Greg. Go ahead. Okay. Um, because <laughs> I, I need my senior scholar uh, because I'm just asking you this question, frankly, Greg, because I want to know your answer. I just want to know what you think about it. <laughs> um, and let me, let me, and I, I got, I got my little introductory quick three sentences about it before I ask you the question. Um, you have to be 18 to be able to vote, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to be 21 to be able to drink. Yep. You got to be uh, 18, sometimes 21, and to be able to serve police officer, military, et cetera. You have to be 18 and over to be able to drive on your own. And the reason why they make these uh, limits, these, these minimums on age, is because the brain in the adolescent is not fully developed for them to be able to make the mature decisions that are necessary to handle handle those types of responsibilities. So my question then is, do you agree or disagree with teens that are 14 and 15 being charged and tried as adults, such as in this case? No, I disagree, of course, for the reasons you said. Um, and, and, and I think it's a scene. I love you, story. Dr. Greg. Yes. What? Okay. Oh, I mean, okay. yeah. you know, you No, it's, it's brave. It's brave and it's bold because sometimes we, we fight for the black boys and we don't want them to be tried. And then the white boys come and do this stuff and we're like, throw them under the jail, you know, give them the electric chair. And I'm like, come on, people. It, what's what's the policy and what what do we believe in? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm excited. No, no, no. Not, don't please don't apologize because I think this is this is the challenge we have. Again, there is no such thing as an abstract human being. And so that's why I think the conversation we're having, you know, Reese and Faraji and me and you, we are, it's all part of a seamless whole. And I agree, Faraji, what you said, there's a culture of violence. So this, this isn't happening worldwide. It, the United States is a gunfighter nation. In other words, mm. the things we worship are violent, whether it be football, whether it be every movie, every television show, damn near everybody interviewed on Roland Martin Unfiltered with a new TV show on here. If you take uh, 50 Cent out of the rotation at Stars, all the violence, I mean, in other words, we worship it. We yes, worship we the do. gun. Now, yeah. you Come know, on. so at the same time, and, and but, but race plays a role. Remember, I'm sure we both remember this, sitting in our constitutional law class and we had to read Milliken versus Bradley. That was a 1974 case where they said the Detroit public schools are segregated, so we're going to loop in 85 surrounding school districts and allow busing into those districts. And Supreme Court struck down the Sixth Circuit and said, you can't do that. Well, Oakland, Michigan, is about halfway between Detroit, 40 miles out of Detroit, and just about 40 miles south of a little place called, um, what's the name of that place? Oh, I can't think of the name of the county right now. But it's the county where, uh, remember this guy, Terry Nichols? Lapeer, yep. Lapeer, Michigan. Terry Nichols was with the Oklahoma bomber, Tim yeah. McVeigh. People yeah. talk about Timothy McVeigh, but Nichols was from a place in Michigan about 40 miles north of the place where this white boy shot up. Now, what does that have to do with what we're talking about right now in violence? Violence is, we're immersed in this violent culture in the United States. When it's around black people, they put metal detectors in the schools. Yeah. I worked in the Philadelphia Public Schools one time. There's this Chinese uh, young uh, lady, a sophomore in high school. We had a Philadelphia Freedom Schools meeting, 300 some students, Chinese students, students, Latinx students, black students, white students. And this child got up, she went to girls high. And she said, until they put metal detectors in girls high school, when there's top public high schools in Philadelphia, you should take them out of all of the other high schools where my peers go to school because you've racialized this violence as yeah. if we somehow won't be violent because we're right. different race, a different That's class. Right. Now, when you put that together, I agree with you, Faraji, you've got people in rural places like Lanier, Michigan, where the, where, where, uh, the guy Nichols is from, Roy's on a farm, think something's being taken away. You've got in Detroit, kids who are b being, uh, you know, assaulting each other, fighting each other, but they're not bringing it to the schools in the same way. And then you got this white boy who feels like probably something's being taken away from him, but he's in an environment where they allow you to take a gun to school, not because they knew about it, but because they put nothing in place to prevent it. Yeah. So mm. if we're not mm. going to charge him with the death penalty, we shouldn't charge anybody uh, as an adult. We shouldn't charge anybody else as an adult, but we have to address the fact that in this country, which isn't a nation, 
People have retreated to their corners based in race-stoked fear that has been mm. further weaponized by allowing white children to get away literally with murder, while black children are treated as suspects when they've done nothing except be walking around. The rules aren't the same. So I think that's the that's the ambiguity where we can say no 14-year-old should be charged as an adult, but when you put race, culture, and reality in it, it isn't this abstract 14-year-old. It, sh it, it almost has to be applied differently depending on circumstances. Right, well, and they are, they are, they have charged him as an adult in this case. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, sometimes I hear an outcry behind that and sometimes I don't. And I think right, it's folks, that's 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 just um, one moment. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Georgia Democrats managed to flip at least seven local races across the state, including in Warner Robins, where voters elected the first woman and first black mayor to lead the city. LaRonda Patrick defeated incumbent mayor Randy Toms. Atlanta also has a new mayor. Andre Dickens will be the 61st mayor of Atlanta after winning Tuesday's runoff over council president Felicia Moore, 64% to 36%. Joining me from Georgia is Fanika Miller, the senior Georgia manager for Black Voters Matter. Welcome, Ms. Miller. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I want to tell you first that I talked to the big boss, Cliff Albright, and he had nothing but great things to say about you and the work that you're doing on the ground and the leadership that you are showing. So congratulations and thank you, because we all need you and the work that your organization does and the work that you do. Thank you. Can't do it without our team. Well, you know what, and it's a great team. I love Latasha and Cliff, but they have a gift also for organizing, absolutely, starting with organizing the best in leadership. Uh, what can you tell us? How, how did this happen? Um, the Warner Robins race is historic. We are so, um, we're still excited and riding on a high. We have a partner, a longtime partner in Warner Robins, Georgia, who's been working for the last decade in order to see um, this transformation happen in community. Um, New Vision is an amazing organization that focuses on um, black women and girls and teaching them how advocacy affects their lives. And so last uh, summer in August, they hit the streets. They delivered the uh, Warner Robins proper for Joe Biden. 
They did the same thing again and flipped that city blue um, for the two Senate races. Then they showed out again in March and delivered a special election at large city council seat. And they hit the ground again in August of this year um, to get voters to the polls one more time in spite of SB 202. And these are the results that we find ourselves in. In fact, uh, turnout for the runoff election last night was double what it was uh, in the general and in 2017 for the runoff. So that partner, we're so happy to support them and do this great work with them. So what do you find is most critical when, you, when you're saying that they're hitting the ground? Is it the pure numbers of people who are there and able to mobilize, or is it the messaging? Because what I'm wondering is, what's, what's the magic formula for what needs to be said for people to understand, yes, your vote does matter, yes, every mm -hmm. vote does matter, and turn that into actually showing up on Election Day? It is reaffirming that black voters matter. It is taking the time to do to have conversations with our community, right, and to have real conversations with our community. It is um, letting folks know that this work is 365 days a year, that the hard work begins on the day after election. So after the presidential election last year, they didn't stop. After the Senate uh, election, they didn't stop. They kept engaging their communities, kept leaning into their power to build um, to build coalitions of broad voters and to engage folks in conversations. This partner and our partners all across the state of Georgia, we have over 130 partners in 75 counties. They attended the first convening a statewide convening where each of them who had elections in their communities learned how to craft a field plan for their community. And they worked those field plans and we experienced results unmatched uh, during the general municipal. And last night, our partners across the state for 12 were 12 for 12, not only elected Miss Patrick, but electing three other first time black mayors across the South and picked up 12 additional seats. And what are your thoughts about the outlook for the governor's race? Um, well, we're going to focus on black voters again. Um, we're going to talk to our people. We're going to talk to them about the issues, make sure that we're connecting the dots. And we hope that that resonates. Again, we are so grateful to see um, Leader Abrams toss her hat into the ring again. But we don't coordinate with candidates. We don't work on behalf of candidates. We work on behalf of the millions of black voters across the state of Georgia on their bread and butter issues. Because at the end of the day, we have to hold all of these elected officials accountable to making sure that they deliver results so that everybody can have a good quality of life. Well, I am just appreciative, and all I can think is multiply, multiply, multiply. I pray that what is being successful in Georgia will become successful, because Lord knows we need it, looking at the way the news is going and the things that people are trying to do to keep us mm -hmm. from our fundamental right of voting. I, I'm going to turn to the panel uh, first. We have someone from Georgia on the panel. And I, uh, Pastor May, do you have a question for Ms. Miller? Well, yeah, Ms. Miller, for first of all, let me say thank you for the work of uh, your organization and what you're doing around the state. Uh, look, so excited to hear about what has gone on around uh, the state of Georgia outside of the metro Atlanta area, which is great as well. You know, last night we had a city of Atlanta mayor's race, and I was excited about the results because my candidate won. What I wasn't excited about was the voter turnout, both in the mm -hmm. general election <laughs> in November and on last night. Um, it, it just seems to me that the voter um, uh, excitement was is not as high as it should be. What can y'all continue to do um, throughout the state to, to gin up that excitement, you know, in preparation for these, uh, for the larger elections that will be coming up next year and beyond? Yeah, excellent yeah. question. Historically, turnout in municipal races is lower um, than it is in midterms and in presidential because there's just not the same level of investment. The top of the ticket drains all the resources and all of the money. And then folks go home and they forget about the municipals. But this year, municipal um, turnout was actually higher than it was in 2017 across the state. It's, it still looks like a small fraction, but black voters and people of color made up about 41% of the turnout in municipals across the state. Down in Brunswick, Georgia, they doubled 
by 100 percent their turnout in municipal races this cycle. Again, in Warner Robins last night, there were about 47, 6,700 voters who voted in a runoff election in 2017, and it was 8,800 last night. So the more that we talk to folks, the more that we focus on community organizing and leaning into the issues and the importance of running in, re in every election, then that's how our folks are going to stay engaged. That's how we're going to continue to win um, all across the state of Georgia. Attorney Manning, do you have a question for Fanika? I, I do, and first I want to congratulate you again on the amazing results. My question is just how can you replicate those same results or the same approach in other places like Texas where I live where, you know, we need um, that kind of institutional support and that kind of strategic planning uh, to yield the same results. So what suggestions do you have for how we can, can replicate that where we are? Well, fortunately for Texas, we have an amazing uh, state organizing manager in Texas as well. And so we know that our sister will be planning and strategizing and seeing how we can do the same thing. It just takes hard work and it is grueling work, right? Um, and making sure that our partners across each one of these um, uh, states stays focused on the end goal and stays focused on, you know, the, the prize. Uh, and so we'll get that strategy together. We'll see wins in Texas. One thing that I know, um, in spite of all voter suppression tactics, in spite of the barriers that folks have put in place, in spite of redistricting efforts, you cannot suppress a people who are familiar with oppression. Right? We're going to win every time. Uh, Attorney Bolden. Yeah. Hey, congratulations last night. But I will say this. Um, you know, the Democratic Party at the national level isn't being very helpful right now. As I travel the country, there's a large amount of voter discontent with the Biden-Harris ticket, the fact that black people put them in the majority in the Senate and the House and the White House, and yet voting rights has not been a priority, or at least they haven't been able to get it done. That's got to be a pretty strong headwind, notwithstanding having Senator Warnock as well as um, Stacey Abrams on the ticket next year. And being able to replicate that black voter turnout, uh, what we're hearing in Washington is that's going to be tough because Democratic voters simply aren't happy that their issues, criminal justice reform and the Voting Rights mm -hmm. Act, simply haven't been made a priority by this administration. How do you respond to those concerns of uh, here in Washington? Uh -oh. My light went out. There we go. Yeah, no, I, we, I am a black voter myself, right? And I echo those mm -hmm. concerns. Um, I have aligned myself with the Democratic Party, you know, for many years before I transitioned um, to this space. Um, and what I'll tell folks that sometimes we just don't trust the system. We told folks last year that if they get out and they vote in record numbers that we were going to get this. And we did, our votes did deliver. Our votes delivered, yep. you know, COVID relief. They, it delivered ARP funds. I call it the Biden and bag, right? Um, but we still have to, to just continue to up. have those conversations with our voters um, and, 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 but not focus so much on the federal and continue to focus on the local elections. That's our sweet spot. And we know that we need federal protection of our voting rights, but we know that that, that help may not come. Right. And so if it doesn't come, what we can do is continue to flip these mayoral seats, flip a school board seat, flip a county sure. commission seat in those down ballot races. That's the sweet spot. And those are the races that are going to impact our communities and black voters the most. Yeah. Good luck. And it'd still be nice to get some federal help, though. <laughs> it would. We agree. Well, Ms. Miller, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. All politics is local after all. So we, we want to back you up any way we can. Tell us how we can help support Black Voters Matter Fund and the work that you're doing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. You can visit our website at www.blackvotersmatterfund.org. You can donate, you can stay connected, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media at blackvotersmatter.org and Black Voters Matter on all social media platforms. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Have a great night. All right, folks, back to our roadblock unfiltered video in just one moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being.
and the voice of Black America rolling. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?